Hey everybody, this is Monte Cristo, and I wanted to come today with a vlog. So there's been a lot of discussion in the community recently about the concept of franchising versus relegation. Seen a bunch of articles from people from around esports, seen some vlogs from people from around esports saying that, oh, you know, this is the owners have been saying, okay, this is what we need. We need franchising. And then a bunch of other personalities in, in the scene have been saying, no, we need these. We need these relegations to keep the competition fierce. Hur, 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 hur. It's so obvious. Of course, the owners are being greedy. Of course, they want franchising. They want the stable slot, but it's bad for esports. And screw those guys. You shouldn't be against, you should be against them 100%. But here's the thing is that in all of these arguments, there's been some very crucial information left out, which is that when we compare esports, and specifically in this instance, the League of Legends e uh, ecosystem, but this actually goes to all esports, as a matter of fact, there are some really core things missing that make these one-to-one -one comparisons actually impossible because these sports leagues are monetized highly differently than esports. And so we're going to get into that. And personally, I maybe at this point in time am leaning a little bit more towards relegation being the right system under certain circumstances, but there is no way you can have an opinion on this topic without actually understanding how teams in esports make money and how that is different from the way that the teams in, say, the English Premier League or the NFL and the NBA the way these teams make money. Because at the end of the day, for team owners, that is the entire concern. The reason why you are hearing every LCS team come out and say franchising, which they don't actually mean, by the way, they don't mean franchising in the way that there is a traditional sports American model that where they would get equity, equal equity in the league, and also be able to dictate the rules of the league and the permanent slot. So if that's what you're thinking, that's not what it means. Uh, they just want the permanent slot, and they're using the word franchising when it isn't actually meaning that. I'm sure they'd love that, but Riot and no developer is actually going to give it to them at this point in time, unfortunately. But we'll get into that. So let's start with talking about traditional sports. So when we talk about the promotion relegation system that exists in soccer in the English Premier League... For the purpose of the video, when I say football, I mean American football because there's not another word for it that I can use. I'm not going to call it hand egg for the entirety of this video. So American football is football. Soccer is what everybody else calls football, okay? So here's the thing. In the English Premier League, you have these group of teams. And this group of teams has ownership over the league. And this is very, very important in both English Premier League and and in traditional sports in America, NBA, MLB, NFL, whatever, NHL, the teams own the league. They own the league. It's very important because that provides them with their main source of income that esports teams don't actually have access to. So how do these how do these organizations make money? Well, the number one driving force behind revenue in traditional sports whether you have relegation or a franchise system, is broadcasting revenue. It's because these teams own the league that they collectively bargain, they all the owners come together and they make a deal with together with a, a broadcasting entity or several entities, and that is where the majority of the income stream comes from. Now, they also make a good amount of money doing things like selling tickets to their stadiums, merchandising, and at a very small level, team sponsorship, okay? It's very important to recognize that team sponsorship is a minute portion of their income stream, okay? So when you have all of these other income streams, sponsors are less and less important, right? So when we talk about esports teams, and I am out of the people who have been making content on this topic, probably the most qualified person to discuss this because I have very recently, until very recently, been a team owner. 
And I understand the shape of the market right now. I understand where sponsors' heads are at because I've talked to so many. I understand the other team owners because I had many conversations with them about this. I am also free to discuss this subject because I am no longer a team owner. So I can be very candid with you and it has no bearing on me or my life in any real way. So where effectively all of the money, like 95% of the money in esports to teams comes from, is it comes from sponsorships, okay? And this is a very, very bad model, very bad. And why the LCS owners are saying that they want permanent slots is because we have all experienced sponsors saying to us, uh, well, relegation exists, so we can't really justify this kind of level of spending for this sponsorship. What happens if you get knocked out? Then we're on the hook for this contract, et cetera, et cetera. So from our perspective, team owners or former team owners like myself, relegation is a huge issue. It prevents us from getting as much money from sponsors or even sponsors at all. Some sponsors just won't won't invest in League of Legends as a result of the system and of the format because it is a death sentence to get sent to the Challenger series because there is no compensation. We'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about relegation versus franchising. But this is the vast majority of the money. Now, the other 5% of the revenue comes from like merchandise sales, but it's still not huge even for the most popular teams, right? It's all about sponsorship. Now, this creates a lot of problems in esports because basically the teams are beholden to the sponsors in a way that they really aren't in other professional sports. Because mostly in professional sports, of course, we see in the Premier League, you know, the, the jerseys with the sponsor names on them. Or we see, for example, in the National Football League that uh, they all wear Nike uniforms as a collective sponsorship for all the teams when they switched a few years back from, from Reebok uniforms to Nike uniforms, et cetera, et cetera. So they do have some obligations, but most of the obligations are carried out by the broadcasters who are selling ads. And it's also important to note that in this food chain of money that exists in traditional sports, what happens is the collected, the league, which is owned by the teams, the teams own the league together, and they collectively bargain with broadcasters. Then the broadcasters provide production, coverage, uh, they sell the ads for the commercials, but their main source of revenue is not actually selling ads. It is selling to cable and satellite service providers like Comcast. So what, for example, when ESPN broadcasts a sports game, they have bought the broadcast rights and to get ESPN on your cable, the cable company is paying Disney that owns ESPN a fee for a package of Disney owned channels that includes ESPN. And then the cable companies charge you for the cable. Okay. So the sponsorships, why this is not a very tenable or good system for esports is that the sponsors exert a huge amount of control over the teams. It affects the way the players practice because there are lots of sponsorship demands for content, interviews with the sponsors, all the stuff that you guys see, these stupid uh, reality television shows where they follow the teams around while they're trying to practice for professional matches. Um, booth appearances, signing appearance, because convention appearances, the sponsors really dictate this. And that, that chips into the lives of the pros and their ability to have free time, practice more, do whatever the hell they want in a very, very big way. It sucks, to be honest. And certainly many athletes in professional sports take personal sponsorships um, and can be very successful, but you don't see that same invasive level to the same degree. Plus these athletes are paid like way more to do this. So it's, it's more worth their time. Um, and also important to note that those sponsorships are not actually a part of the salary that they're paid by the team. But in esports, the teams need these sponsors to get money to pay the players' salaries, and the players are obligated as part of their salaries to do it, for the most part, unless there's a rare individual sponsor. It does happen from time to time, but it is unusual. Um, then the players will make additional money outside of their salary. So it's in their contracts to, to do uh, sponsor obligations, which 
not so much prevalent in regular sports because that's not the way they make their money. They make their money from selling the game. So when we talk about a franchising system in League of Legends or in any game that is primarily run and operated by the developer of the game, almost any problem you hear about in esports or conflict you hear about when it comes to uh, broadcasting or uh, team owners, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, boils down to the fact that the intellectual property of a game is owned by the developer. Now, this is such a thorny topic because if we were to play football or soccer, the NFL doesn't own football. FIFA doesn't own soccer. We could argue, okay, well, they effectively own soccer. They effectively own football. But at least in the case of football in America, we've had many different attempts at creating alternate football leagues like the XFL. Obviously, English Premier League is huge, but there are many other leagues, La Liga in Spain, all these other leagues all over Europe that exist, Champions League, to get all the best teams together. So there is at least theoretically some form of competition that is possible. And no one can stop somebody else from attempting to get professional players and play this game in a way where that they prefer, right? It's controlled by the overwhelming amount of money, perhaps in the English Premier League or in the NFL right now, where they're so rich that it would be basically impossible, barring some extreme act to buy all the players from that league and try and create an entirely different league. Uh, but at the same time, again, you can do it if you want to, and you're not beholden to some company, one company that owns all of the intellectual property rights and can literally stop you from streaming on Twitch, broadcasting on the on TV, anything like that. If the company says they don't want it, just doesn't happen. If I want to create a football league and sell the rights to ESPN, if ESPN wants to buy them and televise them, I can totally do that. Okay. So that's the first level of problem. Now, the second level of problem is that the LCS owners currently own 0% of the LCS. They receive 0% of revenue share, even without owning equity. There could be a different arrangement where they would get some of the revenue from the streams, some of the revenue from the sponsors. Now, what Riot does do is they pay stipends to the teams for the players. Now, these stipends for the players have not increased in basically since the LCS's inception. They added some more stuff like um, $12,000, about $25,000 a year, $12,000 a split for a coach when they decided that coaches were necessary. But some total, an LCS team makes about $225,000 to $250,000 a year in stipends from Riot. And the cost currently of operating an LCS team is at this stage, a top tier team with the way player salaries are, and you include food, housing, support staff, coaching, is probably around approximately $1 million a year. It's very expensive to compete. And it wasn't as expensive before this year, 2016, when the investment capital teams came to play and basically tripled player salaries which is great. It's fine for the players, no problem there, but it did put an additional strain on owners. So to put this in perspective, you have to think about the history of the LCS. So what happened was when the LCS started, uh, Riot, the stipends were great. Uh, they made sure that every player got paid at least 25 grand a year, which obviously, it, in my opinion, is a very small amount of money for the work and practice that they put in but at least allowed that minimum. And it allowed the organizations to survive, basically, when there wasn't as much money in the scene. So then what happened is that, okay, the scene grows, 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 everything's going great, League's the biggest eSport in, in the world, it's the biggest PC game in the world, it's awesome, okay? Everything's blowing up. The sponsors, the endemic sponsors, and when I say endemic, I mean gaming peripherals, PC, parts, energy drinks, things that are in the gaming industry. And when I say non-endemic, I mean like Nike and Coke and big, big companies that really don't have anything to do with gaming. So the endemic sponsors come in and they start 
paying decent money at the time because obviously the viewership was very good. They can get their logos on the teams. They can get all these sponsor deliverables from the most popular game. And that's fine. And basically in 2015, there was a way in which the teams could make a profit. Not a, not a huge profit. Now, you probably think teams like TSM and Cloud9 are a lot richer than they actually are. Um, there was a way that these teams could make a profit. Uh, everything had reached equilibrium. There weren't really any more endemic sponsors. And the endemic sponsors, they really, the, the hardware companies, they really couldn't afford to pay more than they were. The, the value wasn't there for them more than they were really in 2015. So here comes 2016. At the end of 2015, we see teams like Immortals and Energy and Echo Fox entering the scene. And these are teams that are backed by very wealthy investors who are willing to outspend the market because they are hoping to create a team and a fan base now so that when Nike and Coke comes in, when the teams are able to get broadcasting rights, they're established and they can get a piece of that pie in the future. They are not doing it to make a profit right now because that's basically impossible, especially in League of Legends. Especially in League of Legends. So for the players, their salaries effectively tripled um, at the end of 2015. Now... This is great for the players. And, and to be fair, I think the players deserve the money they're making right now. I think it's way better than what they were doing before. And I think they've actually hit a very fair place for the amount of work that they put in. Obviously, as esports grows, I hope the players get millions and millions of dollars. That'd be wonderful. But what it did was it created this strain. Because the endemic sponsors, the sponsors that these teams have, they're not paying them any more money in 2016. And now these teams, basically every League of Legends team is running in the red or with very small, very small profit margins. And that is why you hear all of the owners all of a sudden talking about getting these slots guaranteed. Because frankly, most of them from my conversations and from me also being scared are scared. And they're scared because if, let's say, for for instance, uh, we know that Cloud9 must sell the seed that they just earned. Where's that seed gonna go? Yeah, sure. One of the one of the investment capital teams, like the venture capital teams, was relegated in energy. Doesn't mean they're not gonna buy up a bunch of more players and take another sh crack at it through the challenger scene, um, at in the spring of next year, and then maybe be, be back anyway. But they're afraid of another team that's going to buy that seed and just get all the good players in the offseason. We saw how well teams like Immortals did. And then these owners who do not have these resources, and we can argue, maybe they should sell equity in their teams. Maybe that's the smart thing to do. Go find investment groups that want to invest in them. Go find wealthy individuals. Go find professional sports teams because Lord knows when I was selling my team, uh, would Riot ban me? I probably talked to half a dozen professional sports teams that were considering investing in this space. Now, they, I will tell you, they were all terrified of relegation. They were all American sports teams and don't even really understand the concept of not being franchised. And they certainly didn't understand the concept of not having equity or any kind of revenue share in the league. So that scares a lot of them off. Um, so they're afraid that when these more and more and more of these teams come in, that they're just going to get priced out of the market. So maybe they will have to sell equity. Maybe they will have to spend above the sustainable limit for the time being in the hope, in the, in, in the gamble. And it is a gamble that the money is going to come in in two to three years and the landscape will have changed enough by that time. So that is why these people are obviously trying to protect their investments because of the sponsorships and the way they make money, if they are relegated, their sponsors all vanish, the team is dead. There is no support. If we talk about relegation systems in other leagues, what happens is, is that if you are relegated from the English Premier League, there are parachute payments. There are payments of 
tens of millions of pounds that are made every year if you are relegated from the collective bargaining agreement revenue from broadcasting to help you out while you're down there. Do you know what happens if you get relegated to the challenger scene in NA or EU or anywhere, Korea? You get fucked. You get fucked. You lose all of your revenue. There is no parachute. There is no safety net to help you out. And people complain and say, well, you know, oh, they deserve to get relegated. Do they? Some teams do, sure. Does a team that has a star player and would be maybe a fourth place team who has a serious injury? This is what nearly happened to Cloud9 last year when High got injured. You only have five players. Well, what happens if one of them has a serious injury or a family issue? You just fall. You just fall in it because one person, your team captain, your star player had an issue. Well, all of a sudden you're out of the league. There aren't reserve leagues. Certainly some teams have challenger teams, but everybody's complaining about that too. And rightfully so. It's, it's a inherently flawed system where you can have these teams and send your LCS players down there and boost them for million dollar challenger slots. And I say that as somebody who was literally doing that. I owned the Misfits team that just made EU LCS before Riot forced me to sell it on my ban. So I was nearly in exactly the same position Jack was. Now, do I think this should be possible? No, I don't. Am I going to try and make a million dollars when I have the opportunity to? Yes, of course I am. I needed that money to fund my esports organization. It wasn't like it was going to go in my pocket, but that's very real considerations that these owners are making right now because they are just just falling over their, themselves to try and make ends meet. So please, the problem here is that the team owners, you think they're rich, they're, they're not. They're not doing very well financially right now. The players are doing much better than before. That's fantastic. Uh, for all I know, Riot and the other broadcasters are doing well. That's fantastic. But this is still a system where team owners send their teams into competitions and get 0% of the revenue. And this is not tenable in the long term. This is not a tenable system. And whether you have franchising or whether you have relegation, this is the thing that needs to change. As it stands right now, we have leagues all over the world in esports where the league operators receive all of the sponsorship revenue from that league. They receive all of the ad revenue from that league. And the teams get nothing besides a prize pool, which majority, vast majority goes to the players anyway. And this is really the battle you should be fighting. And this is the battle that's going to have to be fought because to a certain degree, it was necessary. In the earlier days of esports, uh, Riot did a very good thing by creating the LCS. They, there was no way that anybody was going to give that level of production value to esports. Riot did it off their own dime because they were making an awesome product. And if they had outsourced, we saw what happened when they outsourced it to ESL in the early days in Europe. It wasn't anywhere near as good. There wasn't a production company in the West that was capable of doing that and monetizing it and making enough money to improve the production level to the point where it is at Riot currently. But now things have changed, right? Now we have companies like Turner who are producing E-League and they are not part of Valve. And they are doing it because they, they sell their own sponsors. They have their own methods of monetizing E-League. And even if it's not fully monetized, I don't know, they at least think that this market is worth the investment for the long term so they can build something with the esports audience and they're doing it without spending valve's money right valve isn't producing this it's turner and turner has had excellent excellent production value for their first season of e-league so now we're at a point where there are independent broadcasters we know this that can produce a quality on par with the lcs with what riot is doing but it is no longer in-house from the developer now, of course, 
obviously it would be great whether you have a promotion or relegation system for with the teams to have that equity and to be able to own something and sell the broadcasting rights so that you can have sustainable teams because eventually and some people think this is ridiculous but eventually the reality of the situation is there are going to be local geographic teams in esports because at the end of the day it's not good for esports to be based in entirely one city where only you have to fly there in order to see a game. You don't have a geographic connection with your team. I grew up in Colorado. I'm a huge Denver Broncos fan because that's the team my dad taught me to cheer for when I was a child. And I still cheer for the Denver Broncos. So the owners know this and they're very conscientious of the fact that they want lifelong fans. They want those geographic ties because esports is the most uh, mercurial of sports experiences because it changes games every few years or it adds a new game. No eSport has really ever lasted longer as a, a top tier title for more than about 10 years. And you'll say, well, what about Counter-Strike? Well, there've been several different iterations of Counter-Strike and it has like waxed and waned, oscillated wildly in terms of popularity. 1.6 was very attractive when I started in eSports and then uh, source was nobody watched it. So, I mean, it's it's been very, very interesting to see this market. But esports owners in particular want that local team so that as they change games, they can continue to have a fan base, right? They're not as reliant on the players. And also, it's just about selling tickets. It's a major part of revenue. They want to have their own stadiums. Once we get to that point, and I don't think it's coming for another several years, but once we get to the point where teams are rich enough to be able to provide their own venues, of course, they're going to want to settle down in a location and have their local group of fans, have home and away games. That's just fun. And it, it will be built into it, even though we live in a completely digital medium. And that's the other revenue stream that will open up. So let's talk about franchising versus relegation and what that means. Because a lot of people are just shitting all over franchising as a bad concept and making pretty ridiculous arguments against it. And we can look at it in the current state of things. People are saying it's anti-competitive, that teams, if they were guaranteed a slot, they wouldn't try. Um, no. In fact, it's more of a problem in the broadcasting revenue sports because whether you're in the NFL or the NBA or whatever, you're still getting a share of those broadcasting revenue rights, no matter how shitty your team is. And this has created major problems. Look at what's going on with the Philadelphia 76ers. They've been intentionally tanking for draft picks for a really long time now. What happened with the NFL when Andrew Luck was available to draft? It was the whole suck for luck race, which the Colts won to be able to get the first pick in the draft to be able to take Andrew Luck, okay? But when you're guaranteed revenue by broadcasting rights via collective bargaining, that's the real issue. In esports, you don't have any of that. You don't get the broadcast revenue. Again, 95% of your income is coming from sponsors. Now, are sponsors very happy with unpopular players when they need them to make appearances? No. Are sponsors very happy with bad teams that don't have fans that can't drive their product? No. So this is actually less of a concern in esports as it exists right now because all the teams are fighting over the sponsorship money. That's their only money. That's it. That's all they got. So of course they're going to try and be better. Of course they're still going to try and sign the star players, whether or not LCS is franchised. Okay. Another argument, it gets rid of bad owners. And I would agree with that. Um, I think the, it was, that was the, Riot has told me directly that that was the intention behind relegation system was that if they created a relegation system at the start of the LCS, it would churn out bad owners over time, which I agree with. If the state of esports was in, when Riot first started the LCS, it was entirely necessary, entirely. But as we have more and more investors, as we have more and more legitimate business people and uh, a lot of money coming in and the value of these slots at over a million dollars and these teams costing a million dollars a year, for the most part, I think you can trust these people. Um, 
I'm not going to let any of my personal biases get in here or anything, but I think the current ownership group in NA that I'm that I know, I, I know the EU owners less well, uh, I think are good. And so that that concern is, is, I think, less prevalent now than it used to be. I think the most, when we look at the relegation side of things, the most compelling arguments to me is that it allows for new teams to come up for this organic creation of competition, new owners, new brands. And I, I really do think that's powerful. Obviously, I'm biased. I created a new team. I, I ended up qualifying through, for the NALCS via Challenger. So I didn't go out and buy a seed, right? Um, that wasn't the way I did things. So I like that. I think it does create drama. And I think what relegation is great at is making every game matter a lot more. Because for most American leagues where the franchises exist, the bottom teams are just sort of sitting there sucking and there's no reason to watch their games. Whereas there is reason to watch some of these bottom tier games to see, oh man, is this team going to get that seventh seed and get out of you know relegation? They're really fighting for it right now. And as a caster, I actually enjoy those storylines. I enjoyed them in Korea too. I enjoyed them more than I thought I would when uh, it came to Korea and I was actually a part of this as a broadcaster. And I think that that drama drives viewership in, in a way, in a way. So the organic creations of teams, the drama of every game being more impactful, very good reasons to have a relegation system. But right now, the problems are is that it's going to take away money. And you can say, well, well, the next person's just going to be up. Even if Energy gets relegated, even if Schalke gets relegated, they're going to stick around maybe, and it's just be the next one up. And I'm here to tell you that from having spoken to a lot of professional sports teams, it's not going to happen. At least American sports teams, they are scared of esports and they're particularly scared of League of Legends because of relegation. There's no way for them to even participate in that professional league anymore without going through a months and months long process. And it's not like they can just show up at the next tournament and compete and maybe do well if they fix things or made roster changes. It's that now they can't even get top tier players because they're in Challenger unless they already own a team in LCS and have players on contract to send down into Challenger to boost the seeds, right? Um, it's a it's a really big issue for them and they don't understand it. And they're scared by it. And at the end of the day, investments aren't safe, right? There is an element of risk there. It's a calculated, it's, it's a calculated risk that you're going for to make money. But at the same time, when you actually sit down and you look at how these leagues operate, any esports league, and you are a team in the English Premier League, in the NFL, in the NBA, and no matter what, you are you know how the economics of that scene work. And you say, well, where's the broadcasting revenue? And the answer is, there is none. And when you say, where how do we make sure that we have some semblance of control over the rules of this league? Can the owners get together and they decide what the rules are? No, oh, they're told no. This is controlled by the league operators or the developers. These are the only people without any input from the outside that get to decide the rules that your teams play by. The owners, especially in League of Legends, are given zero say. Absolutely none. And then you're told that your entire revenue stream is sponsorships, which is a minority part of most professional sports teams, and that those sponsors are scared to even pay because they don't know about, they're unsure about their own investments due to the existence of relegation. It's a bad look. It, it doesn't really help anybody. And I think that at the end of the day, we can fight about relegation and we can fight about franchising. But if you guys want this industry to actually move forward in a meaningful way where we can actually have a real fight about promotion versus relegation in a way where the teams are actually involved in the league in a revenue share or equity fashion, that is fine. But you're basically fighting over and blaming the team owners when they are desperate right now. They're taking on investors 
because they don't have the money to run their teams. Everybody knows in investment, in the business world right now, that esports is the hot new thing and they're all rushing to plunge money into it. But a lot of the time it ends up in the wrong hands or they think they want to do it most of the time and then they decide, oh wait, no, this is actually a terrible business model for teams because it is. So right now, when the team owners say they want franchising, they would love equity in the LCS. They would love rev share. They would love if Riot actually had sponsors and they were able to get a cut of that income. And even I think if they had that and they had parachute payments like the English Premier League and there was more security for the teams in Challenger and a way to feasibly sort of, if you had a bad season, bootstrap yourself, get yourself back into the LCS, I think they would be okay with that. Now, the thing is, what they want is not franchising. It's not what they're fighting for. They'd love that. They would love that, obviously. But we can, I don't think that's maybe the best way. I think a more robust challenger scene with relegations is a better system. When they say franchising, they just mean a guaranteed seed. They're, they know they're not going to get money or equity or rev share from Riot. They know they're not going to have a, set, a say in the rules of the league. But at the end of the day, this is what we as fans should want for these teams because it's going to be more money for the teams, which means more money for the players. And it means less burden for players from sponsorships. It means less obligations. It means more free time for the players. It's in the best interest of the industry. We have now 100 years or more of professional sports and they all figured this out. And esports is still struggling with this. So before you guys in the future go off on this entire topic and you say, well, I think it should be this because this is what it's like in professional sports. And I like the NFL, so it should be franchise. Or I like soccer and I think relegations are the way to go. They increase competition. You have to remember that at the core of this argument is a revenue issue. And it's very hard to say what the right thing to do is when the teams in real sports and esports monetize entirely differently. Entirely. So keep that in mind, guys. That's the important thing to fight for is more team ownership and equity in these leagues because it will produce more money in the long term and it will give us a real argument to be had as to whether promotion or relegation promotion or franchising is the right model if it's sustainable for the teams. But I am here to tell you right now that as it stands, something's got to change. Either there has to be some other method of sustaining a team in the challenger series after they've been relegated, because right now it is death for a professional team. It is death. If you are reliant on sponsorship money and not this weird League of Legends bubble we're going through right now with venture capital, it's death. And no one's going to invest in you after you've been relegated. Most likely you're going to, your valuation of your team is going to implode and you'll be selling for pennies on the dollar. Okay, so you have to take the money, you have to take the investment money before you get relegated. And maybe people should do this. I was looking to do it, for example, because I wanted that sustainability for the long term and I was willing to sacrifice equity in my team. Didn't end up happening because I was banned, but that was what I was trying to do. So when we argue for a promotion relegation, I agree in theory in a world where it actually functioned monetarily like the English Premier League, fine. In a world where the current monetary system exists, we should probably avoid using the term franchising because that's not what, it, not what it is, but give guaranteed slots to the NALCS teams. So keep that in mind when you're all busy criticizing the owners or shouting about uh, the level of competition being crap in a franchised world because that is, from the owner's perspective, not what this is about at all, at all. So I hope that guy was informative for you guys. Um, like I said, as a recent team owner, I have very strong opinions about this. And I think that gives you additional insights to use when you think about whether the, the franchising or the promotion relegation system is useful. But beyond that, how the teams are in fact very much financially struggling right now. And if we want to move this industry forward, the teams have to start actually getting a piece of the broadcasting revenue and a piece of the larger pie. So thanks for watching.